Good afternoon. My name is John Bambanek here presenting virtually uh, adventures in pro bono digital forensics cases on some uh, of the cases I've worked on uh, in the last uh, couple of years uh, that I've had some time here for uh, to work on some extra things. And we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, as you know, it's all pre-recorded. If you have questions in Discord as, as we go along, I'm happy to answer them or send direct messages. Or if you happen to be in Las Vegas uh, and want to catch up for drinks or coffee, uh, I, am, I am available uh, certainly to talk about things that we're going to get at the very end, my call to action. So a little bit about myself. I am president of my own company, Bambanek Labs, primarily selling uh, threat intelligence feeds, but I do some other consulting as well. But it's my company, so I'm fully independent uh, for the time being. I am getting my PhD in cybersecurity machine learning, but what's relevant for this talk is I helped develop a, a curriculum and taught for about three years digital forensics at the University of Illinois. Uh, I actually don't have any current certifications in forensics, but I've taught it uh, and have used that experience as uh, my gateway into getting judges to approve me as an expert witness because I've developed curriculum that others have used. And some of my students have gone on to be law enforcement officers and how I teach the course. Actually, you, you'll see artifacts of how I present this talk and, and what I focus on. So uh, as an aside, right, I am in the lucky position to be self-employed. So uh, in, in basically a lifestyle company, uh, some of you may be involved with startups, looking for multiples and that kind of thing. But, you know, when you're in a boutique lifestyle company, it, it, there's a lot of freedom that comes along with it to, to pursue things uh, that you find interesting uh, versus things that you just have to do because your boss tells you to do. So between that and the pandemic, uh, I used to be part of the Security Vacation Club. Uh, I'm sure that I've seen some of you uh, participants, you know, around the United States, around the world, uh, that we when we used to do that kind of a thing and not spending time on planes, uh, especially for international travel has freed up a lot more time as well. So I have more time to devote to non-income producing activities, which goes to my last point is that I think uh, at this time in our society and the way things are going, that we should get back and to use our skills. There's, we know like there's a cybersecurity job shortage and, and we could talk about why that is. But more importantly, there's lots of things that are lots of people in groups that aren't getting protected, right? And not just even in the digital forensics or law enforcement sense, but uh, you know, I've talked to PTAs at schools of parents who are trying to protect their kids and they have very little guidance. I mean, they can Google it. Uh, you know, there's any number of groups of people who have cybersecurity needs that are going unmet because uh, they're just folk who don't have infinite num uh, amount of money to pay people. Uh, and as much as possible, we should give back. Obviously, we have to feed our families and, and work. Uh, but for the extent that some of us can do that, uh, I really feel strongly that we should uh, should do that. And a uh, spoiler alert at the end of this talk, I'm going to be asking for your help in some of this. So here's a one hour talk in, in one comic that really underlines the premise of everything. Uh, I don't know if any of you've seen this before. You probably heard the expression. Uh, I actually come from a family of lawyers and judges. Well, actually, lawyers, judges, and petty criminals. So uh, I was built for cybersecurity, but I also have a lot of legal, uh, a lot of inherent legal knowledge, uh, and grew up on law lawyer jokes. Um, so here, here's an older one. You can tell it's black and white, right? You know, you have a pretty good case, Mr. Pitkin. How much justice can you afford, right? is we have a very romanticized idea of the legal system, not just a criminal justice system, but in civil court too, that, hey, each side can fight it out. They've got their lawyers and you know you, you, you get to the point to see who wins. Well, there's a lot more that goes into that, right? Uh, you know, uh, I know my own personal experience of spending lots of money on lawyers that um, you know, a lot of your outcomes in the court system depends on how much resources you bring to bear. Uh, and how much uh, you can spend, and not just in money, but in time and expertise. So here's the agenda of the talk. You know, we're going to talk about the legal system a little bit, because uh, usually what I try to focus on and really beat home when I teach forensics is the legal aspects of what we're doing. Uh, you know, if you're using NCASE or any or Celebrite, the tools do a lot of the work for you. You need to understand what they do, but the things that really uh, can impact the case are things that um, 
don't aren't connected to technology, right? There's uh, you know integrity of evidence and chain of custody. Uh, some of these things that if you don't get right is there goes your case right then and there. And then one of the cases I'm going to talk about does deal with specifically of integrity of evidence. Uh, we're going to deal with three cases specifically that have been dealt dealt with uh, in a potpourri of other kind of matters. Uh, that touched on the legal system and uh, call to action at the end, as I did uh, mention before. So there's a difference between incident response and digital forensics, right? It's possible to respond to an incident without really doing the work of forensics. You know, uh, at a superficial level, right? It seems the same thing, right? How the attackers get in, how do we kick them out? How do we move forward? The difference between IR and forensics is there's a lot of overhead in preparing evidence for use in court. Now, very few of us has ever been called to a witness stand, but the key focus of forensics, uh, including the, the Latin origin of the word, is that it's doing the work to prepare for trials and to prepare evidence, which leads to lots of overhead. I, I, can, I can do incident response without locking hard drives in a safe. Um, you really can't do that with digital forensics. Uh, and like I said, a very key point that deals with some of the imbalances inherent in the legal system is, um, you know, for those of you who are in Discord, I'd be interested to see how many of you have ever been on a witness stand after having done a forensic report. You know, there's probably a, you know, a lot of forensic examiners listening to this talk that, you know, have written tons of reports, but a lot of our work, you know, a lot of the criminal matters I work on deal with overseas suspects, right? We know going in, there probably isn't going to be a trial. Um, you know, I've, I've had clients and, and sat them down. I guess I'm not a great businessman in this way where I've said, okay, you're dealing with ransomware. You want to sit there and, and try to do a, a tort case to recover your losses or whatever. It's like, listen, we can do the overhead of, of doing forensics. You know, I'll run the clock if you want, but bear in mind, we might not ever be able to get this person to trial or probably not. So you're going to be paying me money, but I'm not going to be able to give you a return on that. Um, so, uh, you know, there's lots of that that goes into it. Uh, a lot of people doing forensics work for large, large I, IR firms or well resourced in enterprises. Um, you know, I'm not sure it wouldn't surprise me that there are people with law enforcement agencies, uh, that might be listening to this talk, but we have tools, right? You know, you, you've got NCASE or Celebrite, right? You know, kind of the gold standards of tools, you know, that you have to work with. Um, I doubt very many, there are no forensic examiners in a small business. There probably isn't a security guy, right? You know, there isn't, there isn't a forensic person, you know, at your local PTA or a, a nursing home, right? The elderly have a lot of unique cyber threats directed at them. Um, you know, if you think about business email compromise, right? A lot of people talk about ransomware, but business email compromise or more, more specifically romance scams. There's nobody to protect a victim against a romance scam or, or, or to do the work to bring a prosecution. Uh, and that's billions of dollars lost from that. Um, and like I said, the tools do a lot of the heavy lifting for us. Um, I think it's important to understand what the tools are doing, the science behind the tools. Uh, that certainly is going to help you if you're ever cross-examined. Uh, but it also leads to a degree of laziness. Um, at the end of the day, like I said, when I produce a forensic report, uh, I want to stand by behind all of it, you know, not just some of it, right? If uh, whatever tool I'm using says X, I want to be able to explain in detail why it says X uh, if I'm cross-examined, because that's my credibility on the line. You know, I can't say, well, this tool said it. Um, you have to explain and understand the science behind it. We're going to talk about credibility uh, a little bit more. But this notion is that so very rarely is our work ever challenged in court, uh, even, if, even if the matter ends up in court, there can be a little bit of not, not laziness, but uh, of kind of rustiness, right? We're not used to being scrutinized. And when you know things aren't going to be challenged, you're not as on guard. You're not as thinking through the underlying stuff. Um, and in some matters, it might not matter. You know, you, you may have it if you're doing forensics for an HR investigation of somebody doing something they shouldn't with corporate assets, you know, but in another subset of matters, the outcomes really do have an outsized impact on, on victims and defendants. Uh, and we're going to talk about a couple of those. 
So in the United States and kind of most of the British common law systems anyway, have this notion of an adversarial legal system, right? And that's somewhat romanticized. Each side presents their case to a judge uh, or, or, or to convince a jury or a judge if it's a bench trial, who is uh, the trier of fact will decide you win or you win, right? And both people get their say, they get to call their experts, they get to cross-examine each other's experts and witnesses, uh, and they can get court orders to compel evidence production, right? It sounds all very fair, right? If you're ever uh, in a criminal case, you wanna do all of these things. You know, I don't want to just have the cop say, yeah, he, he shot that guy. I wanna be able to see the body cam footage or CCTV or ballistics reports. I wanna be able to get my own ballistics reports. You know, um, we've seen a lot of how this system works out and plays out in some of the high profile cases we've seen um, with Black Lives Matter and others, right? Those are probably the most public trials that we've had in the past couple of years with Derek Chauvin and the like where, uh, you know, the, the police had their experts and their forensic examiner, uh, their, uh, the coroner who said, um, you know, George Floyd died for X. Uh, others brought in a different uh, coroner or medical, uh, medical expert who then uh, said, no, it was Y, right? So that's a system that works, but only in a certain, a certain case, right? The underlying ex, uh, assumption is that both sides are near parity. And it's not money necessarily, money is important, that's a component, you know, but it's expertise, right? The only person who can question a coroner is another medical examiner. Uh, lawyers may be able to ask some questions, but lawyers need to know a lot of other stuff than just technical areas of specific classes of evidence, right? You know, there are, there are areas that lawyers are experts and they should be experts in. And for that matter, there's, there's things police need to be experts in beyond just the handling of a certain class of evidence. If you think about what the FBI or police officers or detectives need to do, there's, there's a whole lot that they need to be trained and experts on and know natively versus us, right? Who are experts, I can focus on digital forensics. I can give a talk on it. You all can attend a talk on it, right? There's lots of police officers with Celebrites and other tools who, who do the work of forensics, but don't go to talks like this or don't have the same professional um, training and experience that we do. Time is a very important component, uh, especially when people are on the line and need or people's lives are on the line and uh, you know they're looking for certain results in a certain time frame um, or when the government acts and you know you're on the wrong side of the, uh, the government's law enforcement arm. Uh, there's also emotional energy right, is we're going to talk about this briefly, but most cases settle uh, before they ever hit trial. You know, this is some subset of cases where there's a defendant says so like, I'm going to go all the way. I want to challenge this. And once they sit in the room and they see their jury of 12, you know, then there's a recess and they settle it right there, right? Because then it becomes real to them. And that isn't a legal question. That's just an emotional energy question. But really think about just to do with the money question of what your hourly bill rate is if you work for an IR firm or, or what you're billed out at, or if you're just a salaried uh, person who does IR in a company, what you get paid. Now think of anybody in your life or that might have need for examining or handling digital evidence or helping with a, a cybercrime case. Could they pay? There's lots of small organizations, charities. Uh, there was a small media outlet that I helped with a ransomware case. It, it wasn't forensics. It was, that was just IR uh, and ransomware negotiation. But they didn't have any ability to pay. And their insurance policy didn't have any room to pay me, um, even if I wanted to. So there's lots of people who don't have access to the same money or expertise or time or emotional energy. So the assumption of this adversarial legal system where people at near parity doesn't really often exist. Sometimes it does but very rarely does it, right? And the bad news is, as for those of us who work in uh, for large companies or law enforcement agencies or IR firms, is we're on the powerful side of that system. Um, now, generally the people we're investigating with the exception of law enforcement is, uh, you know, we're doing forensics for HR cases and it's usually pretty cut and dry, or we're doing forensics for a cyber crime or an APT case that'll probably never go to trial, right? There's parity there, but that's not all of what exists there. And there's lots of people who are on the, the I don't want to say wrong side, but the disadvantaged side of the criminal or the, the legal system, 
I mean, you've got poor, they can't afford their own lawyers. They got to deal with public defenders who have caseloads that if they were in private practice, they'd be disbarred for having. Uh, you've got other disadvantaged people. You've got uh, persecuted. I'm going to talk about a journalist that the government, that a city government just went after because they were mad. Even middle class people. I mean, we're all upper middle class here in this industry. Um, I should say there might be there might be some entry level people here, but by and large, right? You know, uh, as a class, people who work in cybersecurity can have a pretty pretty secure life, right? We're going to do okay. Um, but if you think about it, if you get unjustly charged with a felony, you know, a criminal defense could run $100,000. Do you have it? I don't, right? You know, like I said, if somebody who's, like I said, who's had to have a lot of retainers on lawyers over the, a lot of lawyers on retainers on lawyers, lawyers on retainer over the years, right? You know, I couldn't afford that. And it was made at least a little easier in my case is that I have lawyers in my family that I can uh, barter, you know, they do stuff for me and I do stuff for them. Um, but the, the hourly bill rate for lawyers for basic stuff was, I don't know, about 250 give or take, right? That goes up very, you know, those bills accumulate very quickly and that could be very hard for anybody to pay. And there's lots of matters where you can't get uh, free, uh, you, you, you aren't entitled to free legal representation, right? In criminal court, you can get a public defender. Uh, there is legal aid for certain classes of things, but a lot of things you, you may not, if you don't have the money for a lawyer, then you're arguing the case yourself. So here's some examples of bad outcomes. Like I said, I think generally the FBI does, does a good job with forensics. Um, you know, I have no beef with card examiners. And, and like I said, generally, I, if I were asked to look over the work, I would expect that they probably got it. There's lots of checks and balances in how the FBI does things. Um, but sometimes they get it wrong. Um, and largely, like I said, it's due to things prior. So this article, uh, had to deal with with hair evidence, right? Is that the FBI labs, the, you know, did various forensic examinations of hair, uh, and were able to get convictions based in part on that. Well, eventually, somebody who's resourced enough hired their own experts, challenged it, and found out, hey, you know what? This, I mean, uh, it's junk science. You know, maybe a step above junk science. You know, it ain't forensic science. Right? It did not have the outcomes they did. But when an FBI expert shows up and says, I did this, I did this, I did this, you know, they got a badge. People take them at their word, unless there's somebody like me or like you who does the work to show that they didn't do it, you know, is when the government presents their experts or one side presents the experts and the other side doesn't have any, it is very, very hard to impeach their work. It really takes another expert. Um, and we're going to keep going to this point uh, in, in a couple of cases I'm going to talk about. All right. So this is a very bad outcome, you know, for a lot of reasons. Is that one, I mean, you had people who were potentially wrongfully convicted. That's bad, right? You know, but as somebody who wants the law enforcement system to work and actually put criminals behind bars, right, there may have been some guilty people who walk free because of the evidentiary errors made here, right? Is that I want my my cops and the fbi and law enforcement to get bad guys i want to get them the right way and make sure that they do it correctly because the way we've calibrated our legal system at least in the criminal sense is you know beyond a reasonable doubt we err on the side of letting bad guys go uh and uh, you know versus keeping the innocent in jail it doesn't always work out that way but like i said there's a notion oh you got off on a technicality well the flip side of the quest, quest uh, that that equation is well did law enforcement do it right you know they have they have they have the high bar and they should have a high bar so there's also lots of other worst cases that we can point to right you can think of any of the cases that pointed to the black lives matter movement and talk and talking about a power differential there right you know there's an entire project or a, 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 there's lots of iterations of this the innocent project of looking at people just on death row going through the cases with a fine tooth comb and seeing if there are in fact people on death row who are innocent. Um, you're right, you know, the outcome of getting that wrong is irreversible. Um, and there have, been, there have been convictions overturned, it turned out that they found people who were in fact innocent for a wide variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. Now, the downside of this is also that, well, I mean, you've been on death row for 20 years, you're free, but you don't get your 20 years back, right? You know, they're not gonna execute you anymore but you've taken a 20 year break from society, right? There, there's no restitution. 
I mean, some states you can get some money or whatever, but money is a poor substitute for time. Um, a lot of the times, you know, the outcomes aren't just a question of malice, right? Is local police have to handle low-end cyber cases, right? The FBI has their thresholds. Not every cyber case is a federal case. Um, you know, now there are police officers, you know, who, who can handle it. You know, I'm in a somewhat rural part of Illinois where, you know, there's a couple of cops, you know, who can do celebrate stuff and a couple of, a couple of other things, you know, but they have other duties as well. Uh, but they've got to handle all of that. And sometimes, you know, things that are complex enough or too complex for a cop, but not uh, reaching the bar of the FBI's threshold means things fall through the cracks, right? Well, but those cops are usually, you know, not well-trained, right? You know, they're, they're, they're cops first or whatever. Sometimes they have a forensic examiner who's, that's their job is to do forensics on behalf of the police, they're not badge carriers, right? Um, but think, right, you know, many of you probably invested in a GCFA or GCFE, not cheap, right? You know, uh, would you settle for cop pay, right? Uh, when knowing your earning potential is high elsewhere, right? The FBI has a hard time retaining cyber agents because they can spend 10 years and then punch out to, to work for mid, uh, mid six figures, right? You know, versus the GS pay scale. Some people will still stay in for a sense of civic duty or whatever, and that's great, but it's known throughout government that, you know, the pay differential between the public and private sector is creating some real problems. But like I said, you know, we're on, we're on the powerful side of an unbalanced power relationship. And uh, if that makes you slightly uncomfortable, uh, that's not a bad outcome. Uh, hopefully, if nothing else you get out of this talk is the, the need to do our jobs correctly and diligently even though we're probably never going to be questioned in court. So my first case uh, that I wanted to uh, bring up was uh, I've started doing some work for public defenders. Uh, I said they have immense caseloads uh, that wouldn't be tolerated in private practice. Um, they've got defendants who can't pay. That's why they have a public defender. Uh, and especially when you get in rural areas, there's, there's no money for it. Um, so as, as a personal anecdote, the only criminal prosecution, and I put prosecution in air quotes, because um, uh, I think there's a couple of matters I was an expert witness on, but, but by and large, it's uh, just helping research uh, and investigate things and feed it to the Bureau for them to do their thing. Um, but obviously, like I said, I've fed and dealt with the FBI, uh, so it's not exactly a conflict of interest, then being a defendant against or uh, helping the defense against the FBI, it, it can get kind of weird. Right, uh, but doing state level work uh, for public defenders is no conflict because I've never worked with the, the Illinois State Police or state's attorneys to help local prosecutions. Not for any reason. It's just it's never come up. The kind of things I dig into are, are large scale billion dollar criminal enterprises, so those are inherently federal. Um, many of these public defenders have never had a digital forensics expert before or any of their peers, you know, so there's lots of things they didn't know how to handle. So it's kind of talking through, okay, how to, how to engage and, and, and you know, work with me. Um, and uh, so I got a case, right, not in the county I'm in, a different one, uh, but it was a CSAM case, unfortunately, uh, referred to by the National, Centers of, National Center of Missing and Exploited Children, who does a lot of work finding this stuff, identifying it on the internet, finding who's sharing it, who's uploading it, uh, and, and getting these people uh, brought to justice, and rightly so, right? It's I think, no desire to have any of this material on the internet anywhere in the world, right? Uh, and primarily uh, NCMEC, there's a lot of hash matching, sometimes actually do image inspection to actually look at the stuff. Um, and in this case, it was tied to a specific uh, Google account. Um, so they were able to inherently trace it to an individual. This, because they've never dealt with a private uh, digital forensics expert before, right? This led to interesting questions about evidence handling. And you can kind of, you know, picture the absurdity of this is like, you know, it's, you know, all of us doing forensics right now are primarily remote, so somebody's sending us evidence, right? You know, so they're saying, oh, you know, um, you know, would you like us to mail the evidence to you on a thumb drive? It's like, no, no, I would not, because that would be a federal crime, and you can't protect me from that, and you can't email it either, right? So, I mean, we're, we're you know, I, you know, so they, they queried it, and I, I still kind of had a problem with that, because, well, now 
I have something in my possession I really don't want to have. Um, but I mean, defense are entitled to defend their clients and they need to see all the evidence and examine it. Uh, the FBI, how they handle this is that, that you know, if you've got a, a federal CSAM case and you've got a, a defense attorney and defense experts, they're just going to have to go to the field office or a residence agency and look at the evidence there uh, on an offline, on network computer, and that's just that, which is a pain. But you know what? Considering the subject material, uh, the subject matter, you know, I'm okay with that, right? You know, if somebody was making me jump through a bunch of hoops for, you know, some fraud case, you know, I'd be irritated. In this case, it's like, yeah, okay, I get it, right? Um, and, and like I said, luckily, like the work I would do with this case doesn't really involve me looking at the images. I mean, the metadata the files or whatever and the network telemetry, sure. Uh, but they really had no process in place, right, here to handle it. And like I said, they're federal questions, right? You know, is, you know, sending it through the US mail is a federal crime, sending it over electronically is a federal crime. You know, uh, possession in some cases is a federal crime, right? And state can't immunize yourself from federal charges, right? So um, kind of talk through that. Well, I actually asked the FBI if they had any, you know, the, the one deconflict is like, by the way, this is what I'm doing. This is why I have it, you know, which led to the, the federal prosecutor uh, giving the prosecutor a call saying, hey, let's not do this. So we'll try to, uh, like I said, make the work of law enforcement better in a place that's never dealt with this is saying, hey, we need to keep this stuff in an evidence locker somewhere, you know, at a police department and an offline computer so that if anybody ever needed to look at it to do the work, they can, but it's just not being uh, transmitted or shared. It's, it's being held in a very controlled way. Uh, so even though as a defense expert, it's not my job to make the prosecution better, at least for this, it's like, glad we kind of went through this, even though it was, it was a very circuitous way of actually starting the case. It's like, hey, let's let's make sure we get the process right in this place, communicate it out. Uh, that way, when it comes up later, um, you know, it's handled correctly, and it's very important to handle this stuff correctly. So uh, the NCMEC identified it hashes with upload events from specific IPs. Uh, those were authenticated to, to a Google account. So kind of knew who they were. Um, and as far as I could tell, they just said, okay, well, you're the owner account, you're the guy. All right, you know, off you go, here are your cuffs, here's the charges, gets a public defender uh, who then hears about me and, and, and contacts me. So the threshold here, right, for a criminal case is beyond a reasonable doubt, right? The defendant says, hey, other people have access to this, right? I'm not the only one with the password. I, you know, that's reasonable. People share passwords. They shouldn't. I mean, we, we tell them not to, but they do. Um, some of the IP addresses involved are locations not connected to the defendant, right? You've never been in that city. Uh, there was mobile and ISP, right? So uh, it was kind of easier to, to identify uh, locations that didn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, but here's an interesting question, right, is that the goals between prosecution and defense experts are different, right? For a prosecution expert, you have to collect all the evidence and analyze it to create a beyond reasonable doubt scenario. That's actually fairly hard to do with digital evidence alone uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, any number of things could happen to that computer, right? Uh, you know, even if it was in this guy's house, did somebody else put it on his computer or is, you know, in, into a cloud account? Uh, because I can't tell that from network telemetry alone about who's sitting at the computer. You need other stuff. Um, and digital evidence is uh, a, a form of hearsay, but there's a couple of exceptions that apply, uh, but can also be circumstantial, right? So there's a lot of legal concepts that come into play. As a defense expert, right, which is a little bit different role than I'm, I'm used to, is why well, I said I've done investigations of large scale crimes that led to federal prosecutions, right? Of getting to beyond a reasonable doubt. A defense expert, I've just got to pick enough holes to say, hey, you don't have it, um, right? It leads to an ethical, ethical question there is, you know, do I want people who traffic in this stuff go free? Well, the flip side of that equation is if you're going to shoot this shot to charge somebody with this kind of stuff, you got to get the case. Um, you got to do the work to close all the loops because if you're being lazy, um, well, maybe lazy is unfair in this case, but not thorough, that opens the door to innocent people being charged with this kind of crime and it is a life altering crime. 
um, uh, to be charged with. And many people, you know, even if they're guilty, you know, plea out because they don't have the resources, they don't have the emotional energy, they don't have the time. Uh, you know, the state overcharges and offers a deal and says, listen, I'm going to put you away for 30 years or you can plea out here and take five. You know, what do you want to do? Do you want to die in jail? Uh, you know, depending on your age, I guess if I'm facing 30 years in jail at my age, that could be an effective death sentence or five years where I can get out, you know, um, yeah, maybe innocent, but the process, you know, that's the kind of weighing criminal defendants have to do. And it's not, uh, it's not as simple as saying, you know what, I'm innocent, right? You know, because everybody's heard horror stories and knows that, you know, the state wants to get you often they can. And if you don't have the money to fight, then you, you got to take the lesser of two evils. So, um, and, and sometimes the best way to make prosecutors and police more effective uh, is to challenge them. The adversarial legal system works because it makes everybody involved better, right? If you're just talking and nobody's actually questioning you or otherwise examining your, your findings, right? You get intellectually lazy, not, not in a moral sense. It's just, you know, there's atrophy involved, right? You know, it, it's always better to have somebody challenging you uh, and challenging your, your analysis and your biases and all the things that go into that. And, and the more that I've done, threat intelligence and intelligence work, the more that those kind of dynamics are the forefront of my mind. Over 90% of cases settle out. Very, very few actually hit, hit court. Of those, right, very few have uh, a defense expert uh, on some evidence, right? Like the FBI hair evidence. They're not effectively cross-examined. You need, you know, an expert to question an expert. You know, and like I said, the system works where there's near parity. It's better for all involved because it makes us all better, right? Having me questioning the work of police or the FBI for that matter is going to make them better uh, over the longer term, right? Um, so I, I said it's an, an important that this system, you know, works works as how we idealize it, uh, not necessarily works how it does today for a lot of people. So here is actually one of my favorite pro bono cases for a wide variety of reasons. And we're gonna talk about this. Um, I was a pro bono expert in a state level CFAA civil prosecution. Um, so like the federal uh, CFAA can be used in criminal and civil court. California has another version of that. Uh, the case is City of Fullerton uh, versus uh, Friends of Fullerton Future. Uh, you can Google that to, to find materials because now that that case is resolved, it was uh, fairly public for uh, this kind of case. Defendant was a journalist, he was a blogger who uh, exposed municipal misconduct uh, with an insecure Dropbox account. The city had an insecure Dropbox, we'll talk about that. Uh, I was connected to the case via the Electronic Frontier Foundation. They have a co-op text listserv where uh, lawyers and others can ask, hey, you know, we did an expert uh, uh, pro bono, sometimes paid to, to help with something. Uh, it's a very low volume list but uh, you know, it's people have nowhere else to turn, turn to the FF, hey, I need a technical expert for something. Uh, so it's a good way to, to pick up things every now and then. But the case is kind of the nexus of, free, uh, of, of the free press, the First Amendment version of the free press, right? Uh, public's record law and using the CFA as a hammer against a blogger, right? I'm sorry for the typo. Um, so uh, I'm gonna assure that many of you here uh, have some feelings about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, as do I. So the basics of this case. Blogger did a FOIA request for documents. Notice the Dropbox had no access control. By no access control, meaning you, you can go to the root of the folder and walk the entire tree. So for FOIA responses, that doesn't really matter because we're really talking about public records. They're seeing other people's uh, public records requests or the, the responses to other people's public records requests, but it's all public records. Governments are very stupidly finicky about this stuff. Like, oh, if you request it, then I'll produce this to you. But if somebody else requests it, then we gotta go do all this work all over again. It's part of this st stupid game many government agencies play to prevent the public from seeing their own government's business. Um, so like many cities, this is, this is where we start to get into hilarious territory, right? You know, they produce a document. Hey, this, this guy requested these documents. Here's all the documents. And the lawyers go through and say, no, you got to redact this. You can't produce this because there's this exemption of the law. 
they communicated all of the unredacted documents to their lawyers using the same Dropbox account that was unprotected. Yes, the communication would be privileged, right? Had they used any mechanism to protect the information. I mean, literally anything, right? But they chose not to. Uh, at one point I brought up as like, you know what? This is actually a pretty serious violation of the California Bar Association's legal rules, right? Because you need to protect privileged communication. And while your client may communicate stuff over an insecure channel, like making things publicly available to the entire planet Earth, you're, you're the lawyer. You should be like, hey, no, you can't do that. We need to come up with a secure mechanism for whatever reason they didn't. So this stuff was all sitting on the internet, uh, freely available. So Ferguson, uh, the guy involved, uh, published many otherwise uh, redacted or unreleased records on police misconduct and other matters. And as you can imagine, hilarity did not ensue. The city was quite pissed. Uh, there was a public records lawsuit uh, that was about to be filed. So they retaliated filing a computer fraud and abuse act, accusing him of hacking the Dropbox accounts. Now, it wasn't just a lawsuit. They talked about this in city council meetings that were quite public. They were quite public to the press. This guy is hacking our Dropbox and stealing documents. Very inflammatory, defamatory language uh, if it would have gone that way. So they searched his computers as workplace. And he's a blogger. He wasn't, he wasn't paid as a journalist, uh, which, which led him to, to losing his job because, I mean, you know, if the police come in and start searching things because of stuff you're doing on your off time, and employers will tend to frown upon that. Uh, and surely the city knew what they were doing when they did that. Uh, the city also hired their own uh, digital forensics expert, uh, and I have that in air quotes, because he was the living embodiment of what never to do in a digital forensic examination, right? It, literally, his expert witness testimony is going to be case studies in my courses, and I'm going to mention this again, of what not to do and what not to say in court, right? Um, the city didn't want Ferguson to access the docs. They called it hacking, unauthorized access, because they didn't explicitly authorize him to use that part of their publicly available website. I'm sure that you're all, your brains are all exploding right now of this kind of preposterous druid logic, a phrase that I tried to include in one of my declarations in court, but the lawyer advised me that was probably too inflammatory for an expert witness report. Right? It's, there was no access control. Everything's live on the internet on a web page, right? There, there is no unauthorized access because there's no technical control to stop it. Nothing was gone around. Um, they also argued because Ferguson at one point used uh, VPN, I forget exactly which one he did, that anyone uh, using a VPN service, no matter the company, was him. Any VPN from that provider was him. For some reason, anybody who used Tor was him. And then anybody from outside the United States was him too. I mean, logical leap to logical leap to logical leap, right? So you can imagine, I'm kind of a, I can be level-headed, but I'm also pretty sarcastic. I try to be level-headed in, in court. It was very hard to write my report based on how absurd some of these claims were. I, I, I don't know if it made it in or not, but I think, what, no, it, it made the cutting room floor or went to the cutting room floor is, you know, they they make connections so tenuous or connections so illusory they border on hallucination right they argued vpns are hacking tools that if you use nord vpn you're a criminal they argued in one of their declarations i used this as as, uh, as my own expert is that i use a vpn to access my campus environment when i'm a phd student to access the network as if i were on the u of i campus they said well clearly that was hacking even though the VPN was provided to me by the university for that express purpose. Um, these are the kind of arguments they were making in court. Um, they're expert. Let me, let, me take, let me emphasize this point. These were arguments made by their technical expert, right? Uh, who, who has IT experience? We'll talk about him in a minute. Here is the worst legal thing they did, the absolute worst. They produced Dropbox logs that they got from Dropbox. They put it in their filing and said, here's the proof. They enriched those logs without disclosing how, why, or with what they enriched them with until I basically tried to reproduce getting Dropbox logs on a new account I set up and said, 
they've added fields. Where did those fields come from? The legal term to describe this is corrupting the integrity of the evidence. You can enrich data, right? But as a defense expert, I need to know and have enough information from your filings to be able to re reproduce your work. I shouldn't have to guess. So when you sign an affidavit that says these are true and complete with no modifications, and they're not, that's also perjury. Um, so it got into very legally uh, dangerous territory for the expert in their case quickly because I was able to reproduce and just like, well, let's see what access logs from Dropbox look like when I download them. It was like, that's not what they look like. What are they doing here? They're adding more information. And then they tried to play it off to the judge. It's like, well, yeah, we enrich, you, you enrich evidence all the time. It's like, yeah, you can do that, but you can't not disclose it until you called out on it. That's not how this works at all. So their examiner, right, runs a small MSP. Now I wanna emphasize, there's a missing S from there. That's not a typo, right? He is not a security provider. He manages ITs and telco and, and help desk and nothing wrong with it. Been doing it for over 20 years, must not be terrible, you know, but he runs an MSP. You look at his LinkedIn profile, there ain't nothing about forensics in there, right? Wrote a bunch of books for John Wiley. There's some network security in there, but mostly IT related topics. You know, but not everybody who does security can do forensics, right? There's lots of legal concepts unconnected to the technology that are very, very important. Like, uh, let me think about this, integrity of the evidence, right? Well, I said, no forensics training that I can find. It's just some guy who knew technology. But really unclear is how he got connected to the case as an expert, but he did. Um, so we red flagged his credentials too, and just says, this guy is not a digital forensics expert. Right? You may know technology, but that's not enough. So, which brings me to a note about training. It's like, I don't, I don't much care for the, the, the gatekeeping that can happen with certifications and security generally, um, but it does matter in forensics, right? And, and that DF really shouldn't be an entry level career track because understanding the technology is more important than being able to click the right buttons and end case or celebrate, right? Um, the most important part about forensics are, are, are not the technology. That's the law, right? We're not legal experts, but they're very specific things we need to be legal experts on, right? Evidence handling, namely, right? Because that's, that's what we do. That's the service we provide. Anybody can punch buttons in end case, right? But it's, it's the, the, the acquisition and analysis of digital evidence in forensically sound matters. And there are legal ways to do that and less than legal ways to do that. And like I said, the tools do the work but you need to understand the science behind it. And that's a problem for cops is that they get to celebrate, they get taught which buttons to push to, to do things out. Uh, and, and it works okay most of the time, but they don't understand what's going on behind the scenes. And that's, I mean, that's not a criticism. It's like cops need to know a lot of different things than cell forensics, um, you know, but if you're gonna engage in high, you know, do a high profile criminal prosecution, you know, it's not unfair to expect that, you know, the government needs to bring their A game. The case was dismissed. More specifically, the city paid the bloggers to dismiss their own case. I don't know if I've ever seen that, right? It's, it's the bloggers, uh, you know, we're going to sue, just hadn't gotten to it yet. You know, the city's like, we'd like to drop this matter and we're gonna give you some money. And we're gonna give your lawyer some money. Now, they couldn't give me money. Uh, and this is an important note uh, uh, that I probably should mention, right? As a digital forensics examiner, I can, I can do anything pro bono I want. What I can't do is contingency billing, where I say, give me 33% or some percent of the judgment, because then my judgment uh, and my analysis is tied to a specific outcome. Uh, and that creates, that that's kind of known to be a problem. Uh, like I said, normally they just withdraw a case, but lots of questions about uh, the constitutional law and the first amendment, the EFF and the media groups, uh, you know, got involved and the shoddy DF work led to a very untenable position for the city to continue. And like I said, I'm using this guy's expert witness reports in a class in classes of how not to do it. You know, we have lots of case studies of doing it correctly. I've only had theoretical cases, you know, examples of how to do it poorly. Now I've got something concrete. So thanks. You're, you've improved my training. So don't be lazy in your forensics reports. Credibility is your most important asset, right? It takes a lifetime to earn and one trash report away from going away. 
um, you know, the only way to question the experts work is with another expert. Uh, and like I said, you know, the, the end day is like the city tried to railroad a blogger uh, and he didn't have the resources to fight back. It took a lot of people who, who stepped up to, to do it to help him out. So my third, third case is, um, if you remember Charlottesville, there's a lot of related cases with Dino Badal and Tanya Gersh with these neo-Nazi groups uh, that raise money in cryptocurrency for legal defense funds. Uh, there's several different cases involved, all torts. You did bad things, so you owe the victims money. Uh, specifically, Andrew Anglin never showed up to court, uh, which is the first actual testimony I've ever done in open court is because he never showed up. Um, but he commented online and fundraised over the lawsuits. So the court eventually said, even though he was evading service, he says, well, clearly you know about the case and you're just being a dick. So we're gonna continue. And if you don't wanna show up, that's fine. We're just gonna have the trial in absentia. Because it was an absentia though, they needed to go through motions they wouldn't have gone through otherwise. Like, you know, odds are in a, in a trial setting, I would have said, this is how I figured out what, what he raised in Bitcoin. They'd examine whether it makes any sense to hire an expert and they probably never would have because there's no one there to examine me. Uh, actually, the judge questioned me at, at several points of how I did my work uh, to, to come to this. So they needed someone to talk about how to uh, enumerate their Bitcoin earnings. Uh, they also gave me financial records, so I was uh, an expert for that piece of it. And it was based off a Twitter bot I, I created several years ago to monitor neo-Nazi fundraising in Bitcoin. So some interesting questions. How do you value Bitcoin uh, at the time of transfer or what it's valued at currently? Do you do the judgment in Bitcoin or US dollars? This is all new questions of law and everybody's kind of looking at me as like, how should we do it? Well, I did it at time of transfer in USD. Um, it was just how I did it. I, I don't know what the right answer is. It was just what I thought was best. I explained it and everybody accepted it. Uh, it's always, it's in Bitcoin, it's easy to get those transactions. Uh, and it led to a lot of adversarial changes of behavior. They're much more careful uh, and nobody really buys them with their legal defense funds because they're not actually hiring lawyers. So Obidala got a 4 million judgment, but judgments are easy, right? It's collection is the hard part where you've got to do the work to go find and, and take the money. Uh, we're experimenting with ways to do that in civil matters with Bitcoin, but it's still very disruptive to their finances. But Bitcoin is also new. There's not a lot of case law there to work off of. Um, you know, we're trying to create some new case law uh, based on some technical expertise I provided, and we'll see where it goes. Um, and just as a random aside, I was able, to, you know, to take my oldest son to drive out to a federal court in Ohio and see what this looks like, right? So, um, you know, it's an opportunity of, of, of seeing a federal civil trial uh, that, uh, you know, he's interested in law and politics. So I got to see that too. The last matter is potpourri. There's lots of other matters that I'm working on, a cyber stalking, sexual harassment cases, some other public defender cases, FOIA cases, I've, I've gotten a couple of. Um, I'm getting a lot of trial experience, or at least producing affidavits for courts. Uh, but there's lots of stuff out there uh, for people who can't pay, and it just so happens I have time. But there's still more uh, than I can do, which leads me to my call to action, right? The system is unbalanced against those who are not sufficiently resourced but there's a huge amount of need, right? Cyber stalking alone, there's probably hundreds of thousands of cases right now of people who, who need help, right? And it could just be locking down cell phones or uh, trying to remove key loggers or whatever, right? Like I said, if they can't pay, they don't get help. And there's, I mean, there's no money to be paid with, but we have skills and experience that can make uh, big differences uh, to these people in a wide variety of matters, right? And, and and like I said, some of these, you don't necessarily need to be, you know, a, a fully trained DF person, right? If somebody's dealing with, you know, cyber stalking or an abusive relationship, right? There are resources for them. Uh, there's the Coalition Against Stalkerware and uh, a couple of other resources. You know, there's uh, lots of technical help that can be provided to people uh, to help out. Uh, you know, like I said, if you're gonna go in courtroom, you probably want a credential but to help people uh, to make cases, even like cyber stalking or, or sexual harassment, it's okay, here you often need to have all the evidence collected to give to the detective. You kind of need to do a lot of their work for them because they have huge caseloads, like what gets to the top of their pile versus what doesn't. You know, if you give them 99% of a case and say, you need to get this, this, and this, and you'll have it, you know, you're much, you get a result much quicker for uh, your clients or the person you're trying to help. 
So I'm setting up a, a 501c3 called Cyber Beast Mode because it just happened to be a domain name a friend a friend of mine had, had to collect, refer, and manage uh, these cases to help the broader society. Um, you know, we'll get the organizational pieces put together. That's fine. Uh, in the very early stages of it, I need people as willing to contribute some of their time. It doesn't have to be a lot, right? You know, somebody could field a case here or there in, in a city, right? There's there's one uh, victim I'm dealing with uh, who lives you know, quite far from me, where it'd be very easy if I were physically there to say, okay, let's let's do this, this, and this. But you can't really talk people remotely through securing their digital lives. You could do some pieces for them. Um, you know, some might not need need to be formally handled. Aren't going to go to you know the criminal uh, criminal or civil court. It's just helping people uh, who are victims of crime to get their lives back. Uh, so if, if, if you're able to contribute, if you want to help, if this sounds interesting to you, uh, you can contact me. My contact information is going to be on the next slide. I'm on Discord, of course. You can find me in Las Vegas. I'll be here until Sunday. You can contact your local, local public defender, uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the co-op tax list. Uh, someone, anyone, and contribute, right? If the net result of this is that you know, some of you contribute, you know, five hours a month to help make people's lives better uh, and, and, and in a pro bono way, you know, we're having real impact in people's uh, digital lives and, and online safety. Um, and that would be a great outcome from this talk. So with that, I will pause for questions. Uh, so we're going to ask on Discord uh, or set up time to, you know, grab a drink here while we're in Vegas. I'm on Twitter, uh, got my email, I'm a fairly accessible person. And thank you for uh, attending this talk. I hope you got some value out of it. I hope you decide to contribute and uh, stay in touch.